Bonjour tout le monde, nous allons commencer. Hi everyone, we'll start tonight's event. Euh, bonjour et bienvenue. Euh, mon nom est Daniel Fizet. Je suis commissaire adjoint en engagement à la Fondation FI pour l'art contemporain et je suis également co-commissaire de l'exposition Conditions d'utilisation qui est présentée actuellement à la Fondation euh, et que j'ai co-commissariat avec ma collègue Cheryl Sim. Before we get started with tonight's event, uh, we would like to acknowledge that the Phi Foundation is located on unceded Indigenous territory. This territory is known as jo uh, Jojage to the Ganyangahaga and Munyang to the Anishinaabe. It is historically known as a meeting place between many First Nations, and today it is home to a diversified population of Indigenous and other peoples. It is our sincere hope that this event honors a spirit of mutual exchange and respect. Uh, L'événement de ce soir va se dérouler en anglais. Il sera enregistré et une version sous-titrée en français sera rendue disponible sur nos plateformes dans les plus brefs délais. Euh, je vais par contre inviter le public à poser des questions dans les deux langues, euh, dans les deux langues, et je pourrai traduire les questions au besoin. So the uh, tonight's event will take place in English. It will be recorded, and a version will be made available on our platforms after the event. And questions can be asked throughout the presentation in both languages. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the Phi Foundation, we're delighted to welcome researcher Mikael Prou for an online lecture entitled Cyber Powwow Indigenous Networks on the Electronic Frontier. The talk is offered in conjunction with the exhibition Terms of Use, uh, which presents a newly restored version of Cyber Powwow. Uh, the project was launched in 1997 for the sharing of network art made by Indigenous artists. As part of the collective nation to nation, the Ganyangahaga artist Skawanadi created the platform within a context of self-determination movements that ran parallel to the rise of the internet. Mikhail's discussion will look at the intersection of network media and ind indigenous self-determination to offer a reading of the internet as a settler colonial space and attend to this landmark platform for indigenous digital culture. Mikel Prou is an art researcher who has curated exhibitions across North America, Europe, and the Middle East. He lives in Montreal, where he recently defended his dissertation, a study of network-based art and social practice in Canada, which was awarded a top thesis prize from Leonardo Journal. Congratulations on that, Mikel. Uh, his research considers network culture from queer feminist and settler colonial perspectives, and has been recently presented at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, the Archivists Roundtable of Metropolitan New York, Goldsmiths College London, Yale University, and the New Museum of Contemporary Art New York. His first monographic book, soon to be published with McGill Queens University Press, considers representations of queer sexualities in Weimar Berlin, Weimar Berlin, I should say. I, I need to brush up on my German pronunciation there. Uh, in recent projects, he has collaborated with the artists Margaret Jagu, Skawinati, Peter Fleming, Vera Frankel, Anna Banana, and Rita McCo. Uh, welcome, uh, Mikael, and I'll, uh, I'm uh, lending the mic to you now. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's been a real pleasure working with you and Cheryl and Dahlia and everyone at FI. So thanks for inviting me to do this. And of course, a big thank you to Skawanadi, who's invited me to think about this exhibition and to think about Cyber Powwow, this remarkable digital art platform that began 25 years ago. Skawanadi and I have been thinking through some of these ideas together for the past decade, doing research, writing together, and making exhibitions and events and an archive together. So I'm super grateful to have been uh, in discussion with Skawanadi for uh, many years now. I grew up in a big settler family on, on the Big River, also known as the Columbia River, also known as Sinaiqua in the local Sinaiqs language. Uh, my family has been in Canada for 15 generations. The Prus were among the earliest families from France to settle in the St. Lawrence Valley on traditional Abenaki land in the early 17th century. And so I come at the research that I'm sharing with you today as a non-Indigenous person, asking questions about settler Indigenous relations generally, and specifically about how these relations have shaped some of our visual media environments. As Daniel mentioned, 
Um, cyber powwow is currently on display at the Phi Foundation, thanks to recent restoration efforts by Dragon Espensheed of Rhizome in New York City, and by uh, Jason Edward Lewis, a professor at Concordia University and one-time participant of Cyber Powwow. So it's uh, really exciting that we have uh, the art platform preserved and accessible for those of you who are here in Montreal. The project, as, as some of you will know, was launched by Scalinati, the great Ganengehaga Mohawk cyberpunk artist in 1997, when she was part of the artist collective Nation to Nation. Cyberpower ran for eight years, supported 24 contributors, and is to date the largest platform for digital art made by Indigenous artists. And so today I'd like to introduce some of Cyberpower, this expansive platform for digital art, but I'll also trace out a legacy of misappropriation and dispossession on the early web in order to center on counter narratives of the dominant erasure of indigenous peoples within settler visual cultures. Ultimately, I'm working to open up discussions about network culture that center indigenous accounts of early cyber cultures, romantic and extractive attitudes towards indigenous peoples. I mean to highlight the ideological context of the internet into which cyber powwow intervened. And so I'll also look to earlier chapters in the history of the internet in the 1960s and 70s, when uh, particularly optimistic visions of networks took root by early figures in the counterculture. And these uh, countercultural figures, the early adopters of the internet, often had peculiar and extractive relations with indigenous peoples and cultures. What I expect to share with you all today is a view of how cyber powwow challenged the foundations of cyber culture, rooted as they are in extractive and techno-primitivist ideologies. Cyber Powell was initiated by Scalinati in 1997, ran for nearly a decade, providing a platform for digital art made by Indigenous and some non-Indigenous artists. The project came about in a, in a perfect storm, okay, when new communications technological infrastructure expanded concurrently with Indigenous cultural activism, and large shifts in Canadian institutional politics, right? All of which saw distinct developments in the early 90s and all of which coalesced to produce the conditions that made cyber powwow possible. Bringing internet-based art made by indigenous people into the public, cyber powwow emerged at this historical juncture to present a distinctly indigenous presence on this new global network. The project emerged from a context of self-determination and cultural revitalization movements that ran parallel to the rise of the internet. This was an early robust accomplishment that formalized a uniquely indigenous presence online. While cyber powwow represented these concerns in network media, it was also linked to the offline political climate of indigenous sovereignty that surged simultaneously. In the middle of the 1990s, Scalinati was a member of the artist collective Nation to Nation, alongside the artists Ryan Rice and Eric Robertson. The collective hosted a series of exhibitions, performances, and workshops to showcase uh, visual art, poetry, and music made by a growing community of Indigenous artists. And their efforts have really proven to be instrumental in the formation of both contemporary Indigenous art and new media art in Canada. By 1997, with a handful of art shows, performances, and community projects under their belts, Nation to Nation launched Cyber Pow Wow. The collective soon dispersed, and the run of Cyber Pow Wow was overseen by Scalinati alone. Cyber Pow Wow is among the very first exhibitions of internet-based art, though it remains under-acknowledged within dominant discourse of the field. In four exhibitions over eight years, the project supported dozens of artists, curators, and writers who created artwork and texts for a real-time graphical chat service that was live year-round. Cyber Powwow utilized a piece of server software that you're looking at here called the Palace. In place of the Arbor, commonly used by powwow dancers, Cyber Powwow would congregate its participants around the structure of this software. The Palace was a multi-user environment in which individual users could join within a graphical chat space as avatars, 
to experience a range of different artist-generated rooms. Each room displayed graphics and sounds in relatively fast downloading files that allowed participants to interact with graphical environments and with each other. For Scalinati and the other Nation to Nation members, the palace offered a compelling way to sustain and extend the community of contemporary Indigenous art generated by their previous exhibition activity. As Rice has recalled, quote, the World Wide Web offered cyberspace, a place beyond colonial borders and limitations as a newfound form of freedom that nation to nation was well suited to embrace. Throughout this uh, eight year run, Cyber Powwow commissioned artwork from 24 contributors and they varied in terms of their technical competency from computer newbies like the Squamish artist, Michelle Nahani to accomplished media producers like the Hawaiian and Samoan artist, Jason Edward Lewis. They also represented a range of art world prominence from then emerging artists like Laurie Blondeau, who I'll mention more of in a moment, to the established Métis artist Edward Poitra, who had uh, just three years prior to his involvement in Cyber Pow Wow represented Canada at the 1995 Venice Biennial. <clears throat> e to Cyber Pow Wow was the series of exhibition openings that Scalinati called gathering sites. These were real world events that exhibited the online artworks and were held at over 20 galleries and artist run centers across North America, coinciding with the four biennial launches of the project. Each space supported simultaneous two day events, expanded exhibition openings basically, during which time visitors were invited to eat, drink and become participants via online interaction. Tech-savvy gallery attendants would guide users through the project on computer stations, as in the mid-90s, personal ownership of computers was not yet prevalent, especially among Indigenous populations. While Cyber Pow Wow is accessible year-round, the great majority of its social interactions took place during these gathering sites in both physical and virtual spaces simultaneously. Among histories of better documented net art, this exhibition model remains remarkable today. And the project, I think, deserves real recognition for its strategies of display and engagement. Nation to Nation was formed during a hugely significant moment for artists within the context of Indigenous sovereignty struggles in Canada. The summer of 1990 had seen this groundswell of political activity with both the opposition to the Meech Lake Accord and the Gunasataga resistance, also called the Oka Crisis. <clears throat> and many Indigenous artists have spoken about the importance of the Oka Crisis in terms of how it really catalyzed a community of political-minded artists uh, across Canada and beyond. And here you're looking at screen grabs from uh, the contribution of the late Cree and Métis artist Ahasi Meskaganisque, to the 2001 Cyber Palo 2K, which referenced the Oka crisis. Ahasu pulled together a number of sources for his artwork here, including family photos and found images. And he also included an image on the right here of this appalling event that took place at uh, Whiskey Trench, which I'm sure some of you know about. In uh, August of 1990, Quebec police, then in conflict with uh, Ganingahaga warriors, had broken their promise of granting safe passage to 75 cars full of Indigenous children, women, and elders who had left the community of Ganawage. The caravan was made to wait for hours in the hot Quebec sun, and then as they passed a stretch of the highway known locally as Whiskey Trench, a gauntlet of 250 white men, unhindered by the police force of upwards of 40 officers, pelted the caravan with stones, shattering windows and injuring dozens of people. This heinous event was famously recorded in Abenaki filmmaker Alanis Abomsawin's 2000 documentary, Rocks at Whiskey Trench, <clears throat> which is where Ahasi sourced his imagery for Cyber Pow Wow. And so Cyber Pow Wow was really created with the intention of bringing aesthetic and political content from Indigenous perspectives online. For Scalinati, this was central to her inaugurating the first cyber powwow in 1997. Citing the events of 1990, she wrote that, quote, 
Since then, a new community has been forming, one whose membership criteria is self-determined, not imposed by colonialist guidelines. This community doesn't have a territory because it doesn't need one. It has the infinite expanses of cyberspace. Cyber Powwow provided a platform for artists just as shifts in public discussions about identity politics took place simultaneously as the internet was widely entering people's lives. And while these large shifts in governmental relations between Canada and Indigenous societies took place, so too did major shifts in Canadian cultural institutions at both official and grassroots levels. It was within this context at the confluence of artist-run culture, network technologies, and Indigenous sovereignty that Cyber Pow Wow was conceived of as an artist-run center in virtual space, as Scalinati wrote. This occupation of cyberspace came at a pivotal moment in which Indigenous artists took to new net media networks in great effect. Indigenous artists have occupied central roles in the cultural history of the web, despite their continued sidelining in histories of net art and digital culture more generally. Just as Indigenous inclusion in the art world was reaching new heights, developments in media and technology were likewise surging. Resultingly, the period saw a proliferation of Indigenous-led media platforms throughout the early 90s. When Matthew Kuhn Kum was National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations in 2001, he expressed, uh, quote, we missed the Industrial Revolution, we will not miss the Information Technology Revolution. And so Indigenous activity flourished within the nascent cybercultures of chat rooms, message boards, mailing lists, webzines, and personal homepages. Amid better known web art platforms, such as The Thing, Rhizome, and NetTime, Cyber Powwow counted itself as one of only a few emergent virtual spaces for Indigenous art online. And, and Scalinati was really motivated by this surge of online Indigenous content. But while the stakes of creating an Aboriginal territory in cyberspace was explicit for Cyber Powwow's participants at the time, in retrospect today, one can better appreciate how their inventive and critical uses of new media both relate to and differ from longer legacies of cyber utopianism. As the internet developed after the 1960s, and especially during the spread of the web in the 1990s, network culture was increasingly understood through notions of the global village, cyber tribes, and techno primitives, which carried forward Eurocentric perspectives of indigenous peoples as pre-technological. These racist phenomena are manifest within the settler digital visual cultures of the period. At the same time, a rich legacy of Indigenous cultural criticism formed during the rise of the internet. And so I want to um, identify this Indigenous intellectual legacy, which formed just as Scalinati and her collaborators turned to the form of the powwow to consider Indigenous cultural practices for the internet age. And I want to uh, suggest for you today that, that cyber powwow fostered a virtual community not reduced to the corrupt legacy of the global village. Cyber powwow directly confronted cliches that misconstrued indigenous peoples as pre-technological, a racist ideology conventionally deployed in descriptions of indigenous peoples as the uh, Yankton Dakota historian Philip Deloria notes in terms of technological incompetence. As the uh, Tuscarora art historian Julian Rickard observed of cyber powwow, quote, the idea that Indians would be on the frontier of a technology is inconsistent with the dominant image of traditional Indians. From its outset, the popular imaginary of cyberspace possessed a distinctly neo-colonial ethos, from William Gibson's data cowboys to metaphors of the internet as an information superhighway and as electronic frontier, the net's most popular metaphors were allied to the deeply troubling language of pioneering conquest that has historically been linked to processes of dispossession and genocide. Consider the first web browsers, which had names like Explorer, Conqueror, and Navigator. 
where imperial powers exercised manifest destiny across territories regarded by European settlers as terra nullius or empty land, communications networks followed. As Scawinati has written together with her partner, Jason Edward Lewis, quote, if Aboriginal peoples learn one thing from contact, it is the danger of seeing any place as terra nullius, even cyberspace. Its foundations were designed with a specific logic built on a specific form of technology and first used for specific purposes. Deloria has noted that the postmodern context of the early web was rife for extractive pastiche and misappropriation where quote, meaning itself was often up for grabs. In the mid nineties, this appropriative phenomenon was widespread as critically addressed at the time by Paula Geese uh, an Ojibwe woman and a, and a prolific early uh, content creator. The most malignant of these cyber shamans and pseudo tribes, as she wrote, were seen in the form of web publishers who feigned tribal affiliation to sell various so-called native goods and services that have no connection with actual tribes. And so settler technologist misappropriation of indigenous peoples and concepts was extensive on the early web. For example, here in popular web corporations that assumed indigenous imagery at the time, including uh, Inktame, which is a misappropriation of the Lakota trickster spider and uh, one time top search engine of the internet and the web server software Apache, which is still in use today. Another glorious misappropriation of the early web uh, was the popular chat program Pow Wow, emphatically not to be confused with Cyber Pow Wow. After selling his stakes in his successful antivirus software corporation in 1994, the American technologist John McAfee uh, reportedly, quote, bought a Winnebago and drove around the Western United States visiting various Native American tribes for a year. By the end of that year, he had obtained 400 acres of land in Colorado, founded the company Tribal Voice Inc., had purchased the URL tribal.com, and had launched the world's first instant messaging service. He named it Pow Wow and falsely claimed that it was run by Native Americans. Pow Wow was among the first popular social media platforms and it provided tools that would influence subsequent internet chat programs like real-time instant messaging, voice chat, file sharing, and collaborative whiteboards shared among interest groups called tribes. Predating Cyber Pow Wow by several years, Pow Wow registered an estimated 8 million users between 94 and 2000. Tribal Voice also offered its uh, uh, users access to peculiar misappropriative online spaces such as the Warrior's Lounge, the Sweat Lodge, and the Pipe Carrier's Space. Among the various social initiatives supported by Pow Wow was a venture for user-submitted logos, many of which featured icons of teepees, feathers, and dream catchers, such as this image by the graphic artist Glenn Southern. Pow Wow's techno-primitivist tribes were led by McAfee, who, uh, in his writing on it, likened himself to the Sioux sacred clown figure, Hayoka, in a flagrant act of misappropriation decried by Paula Geese as a religious desecration game. And so uh, just as cyber powwow began putting content online, settler development of the internet took on a peculiar fascination with romantic imagery of indigenous societies. Early web technologists would enact a cyber libertarian ambition to redefine society in the image of the tribe. Moreover, this phenomenon stemmed from a decades long misappropriation of indigenous cultural values that can be traced to the beginnings of the internet in the 1960s. In the middle of the last century, the advent of electric, electronic media alerted Marshall McLuhan that the electric global network would bring about the next stage of human history. This would entail, he argued, a social transformation for the collective betterment of the world. In place of the historically isolated individuals of print-based cultures, the electronic media would ensure a communal and connected global society. Such a techno 
cultural shift, McLuhan famously stated, quote, recreates the world in the image of a global village. Inhabitants of this new village would be retribalized in network communities, he argued, and would enter a new state of multi multitudinous tribal existences. Okay? Simultaneous to McLuhan's formalization of the global village, the counterculture likewise saw a model of a new social order in the form of the American Indian. Settler hippies romanticized indigenous cultures, misappropriated and reified on communes in rawhide and plastic beads in a gesture that the historian of counterculture Ted Rozak describes as voluntary primitivism. Such stereotypes of the primitive, the, the Cree scholar Greg Youngin recognizes, are libelous characterizations of indigenous peoples as an uncivilized, unrefined, unchristian, violent, unstructured peoples defined as Philip Deloria notes by their primitivism, technological incompetence, physical distance, and cultural difference. The romantic appeal of the village and of tribal life allured estranged Westerners to a perceived sharing of values and connection to community apparently common to indigenous peoples. For McLuhan, new electronic media offered a path of escape from individualistic habits. The new media would advance strong kinship structures and interdependence in step with the preliterate, magical, savage social conditions of the tribal habits of participation and collective identity. Electronic technology retribalizes, he wrote. McLuhan's notion of the global village and its basis in the appropriation of indigenous cultural values was hugely influential, including for the history of the internet. And here I'm, I'm, I'm showing just one of many early digital communications networks born from the counterculture. Tenets of the internet today, autonomy, cooperation, egalitarianism, developed in these romantic views of indigenous peoples that emerged in the 1960s. Among the many examples of feathered and rawhide tasseled settler pseudo-tribalism was the 1967 San Francisco Human Being, a powwow gathering of the tribes, as was advertised. Leading into the summer of love, the Human Being, be in, was held in January of 67 in Golden Gate Park's Polo Fields. Organizers hired the psychedelic poster artist Rick Griffin, who made use of an 1890 image by the Old West illustrator Frederick Remington featuring a Modoc scout on horseback. But in Griffin's repurposing of Remington's image, as you see here, the scout's rifle is replaced by an electric guitar. Right? Stylistically, such apparent clashes of old and new would come to be known as techno-primitivism. Here, icons of the technological future met stereotypes of the pre-industrial savage. The BN was enormous. Over 20,000 people participated in spontaneous and unscripted dancing, performance, music, and poetry. Uh, the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane performed, and Allen Ginsberg sang Vaishnava mantras as hippie chic attendees indiscriminately wore feathers, fringe rawhide, and beads, smoked from peace pipes, carried sitars, and read the I Ching. It was here that Timothy Leary first uttered his famous phrase, turn in, tune in, drop out. The American counterculture of this time also impacted the early foundations of digital networks. And one significant figure at this intersection is Stuart Brand, who is uh, well, regard well regarded as a, as a forefather of cyberspace. But what is rather less studied is Brand's connection to indigenous peoples. Before he published the Whole Earth Catalog, before his technology and entrepreneurial career when he would uh, coin the term personal computer, and before he produced one of the earliest and best known virtual communities in the 1980s, Brand looked to indigenous peoples in his techno-primitivist speculation of new social models. And just briefly, I'll mention this, uh, Trips Festival, which was billed as a peyote meeting without peyote, and America Needs Indians, which was Brand's traveling uh, multimedia show. 
Brand articulated the countercultural appeal to appropriate indigenous cultures himself in 1972. Quote, from a distance, Indians looked perfect, ecological, spiritual, tribal, anarchistic, drug using, exotic, native, and wronged. The lone genuine holdouts against the American plastic nightmare. Right? Indigenous peoples represented a kind of curative model for people like Brand an idealization that appealed to the counterculture sense of alienation from corporate and militaristic technologies and their desire for forms of living alternative to white American middle-class values. The Indian for them was spiritual and grounded and connected to the natural world. And yet this was precisely the stereotyped image of indigenous peoples that advanced colonization and civilization as the Shimshian Haida art historian Marcia Crosby has noted, as she writes, it was here that, quote, a composite singular imaginary Indian functioned as a peripheral but necessary component of Europeans' history in North America, the negative space of the positive force of colonialist hegemony. So at the advent of digital networks, while settler hippies looked to this imaginary Indian, they proved to be blind to indigenous peoples, ongoing political struggles and their cultural vitalities. But simultaneously to this, indigenous actors were working like never before toward renewed treaty rights, land management, self-determination and sovereignty of communities, as well as to the revitalization of cultural practices like the powwow. While uh, most of the artists who were invited to make work for Cyber Pow Wow did not conceive of artwork on the theme of uh, the Pow Wow, the Cree Soto Metis artist Lori Blondeau, together with her hired technician, Leah Lazariak, uh, developed a participatory platform for an online version of the Round Dance for her contribution to Cyber Pow Wow 2 in 1999. Blondeau's artwork had the avatars of each remote participant follow her lead in a rhythmic circular movement to an accompanied drumming audio track within this virtual space. We don't have documentation of the social artwork, but here we're looking at one of the virtual rooms that the dance uh, took place in. It was a fun and lighthearted experiment that asserted a traditional social practice into new media. <clears throat> Uh, a feature at many powwows, the round dance is a collective dance form existent in multiple cultures across the prairies. It's traditionally performed to mark significant social events, introduce communities to each other, and more recently has been utilized for community organizing and activism. The round dance is a form of social action engaged in cultural as well as political and economic production co-created through the social flow of the powwow. At the end of the 19th century, as the new nation of Canada attempted to assimilate all Indigenous people as Christian subjects, a ban on cultural ceremonies was enforced. However, in spite of these colonial measures, many ceremonies and cultural gatherings were still practiced illegally as ceremonial knowledge and rituals went underground. At the same time, powwows began to be staged for non-Indigenous viewers within colonial settler publics. At this period, uh, powwow gatherings underwent a transformation. While well, public powwows after the ceremonial ban were often shaped by imposing romantic and belittling views, the gatherings also fostered practices outside the tourist gaze. As the anthropologist Bruce Alden Cox notes, quote, these encampments were not cowboy and Indian shows written, produced, and directed by white impresarios. They were native exhibitions and performances produced by the Indians themselves and very much following their own script, end quote. The powwow engages a legacy of diverse indigenous peoples gathering together in spite of oppressive forces. Less than a decade after its inauguration as Canada's first national park, Banff began hosting its first annual Indian Days in 1894. These spectacles were sanctioned by white settlers of the picturesque tourist town, 
and typecast some of the area's original inhabitants, the Stony Nakoda, who had within a lifetime prior been revoked occupation and hunting rights and been systematically expelled from their land. Sponsored by the Canadian Pacific Railway, Banff Indian Days hosted a parade, games, food, and staged powwows for which Stony Nakoda were hired to display stereotyped clothing and dance and song. Banff Indian Days was part of a larger settler colonial project of excluding Indigenous peoples from their land while simultaneously benefiting from incorporating the image of the tragic vanishing Indian figure, representing the taming of Canada's rugged wilderness within a national identity. Blondeau's artwork reappropriates one image from the predominant visual culture of this nationalist strategy. It is a mass-produced lithograph commissioned by the National Railway and created by a white settler artist. But even within this heinous tourist festival, the image of the contrived spectacle nonetheless conveys some of the political agency expressed by Indigenous peoples at the time. Stony Nakoda, and likely also people from uh, uh, Blackfoot, Sutina, Tunaha, and Plains and Woodland Creek communities leveraged their subordinated presence at the festival to gain access to their lands, to continue certain cultural practices, and to develop new political alliances. Within the graphic representation, as you see here, of the natural landscape of the Rocky Mountains, the group seems at first glance to be likewise framed as pristine, undeveloped, and monolithic. Indian Day's organizers enforced a traditional Indian clothing policy, manifesting a racist paradox where stereotypes misconstrued these people as uncivilized, while those same people were required to act tame as acceptable park spectacles for the non-Indigenous tourists. Indigenous participants were even endowed with cash prizes for most authentic looking Indian. But within this assimilationist context, the Stony Nakoda could exercise some degree of agency. And this is evidenced, I think, in, in, in multiple figures in this poster, such as the man in the right foreground, wearing the uh, modern clothing of the cowboy. Uh, uh, he pushes against the cliche of the pre-modern, pre-literate Indian. A century of powwow practice demonstrates how powerful collective identities and shared senses of community have served the persistence of cultural traditions. It is this legacy taken up by cyber powwow. Writing about the art platform in 99, Jolene Rickard affirmed, quote, the appropriation of the term powwow is consistent with First Nations strategies for self-empowerment. So just as Stony Nakoda participants in the Banff Indian Days leveraged restrictive colonial forces to adapt and develop ceremonial practice, Blondeau's virtual round dance analogously, if you know, jestingly, made space for an indigenous cultural practice within the new restrictive space of the internet. Like other cyber powwow artists, Laurie's artwork took power by asserting an indigenous cultural expression that refuses to be relegated to the historical past. Okay, so some concluding thoughts. Um, cyber powwow stands as a counterpoint to the suspicious tone of progress and conquest that has accompanied much cyber utopian discourse since the 1960s and it belongs to longer legacies of indigenous cultural vitality and resistance to colonial forces. Cyber powwow's mediatized gatherings, I think, also present a critical model for alternative social media in line with what Geert Lovink and Ned Rositer term orgnets or organized networks. They write, quote, what concepts such as orgnets do is provide coordinates for practices that structure data flows and sociality in ways that do not submit to the techniques of extraction special to social media. Perhaps Indigenous artists have been especially primed to circumnavigate these extractive techniques. Certainly, cyber powwow and the wider context of Indigenous digital media production of the 1990s centered on collaborative, decentralized, organized networks. These are not mainstream images of the future, focused on the myth of the pioneering individual, but rather our collective 
indigenous determined social imaginaries and images of the future. For indigenous peoples facing aggressive assimilationist policies, this approach has resulted in the occupying and maintaining of an indigenous presence in cyberspace. Cyber powwow is a notable paragon in this recent digital art history in which online indigenous cultural initiatives manifest new ways of relating to put digital tools in the service of culture and community. The project deserves better attention for its place within legacies of network culture and digital sovereignty. The Lakota scholar Vine Deloria Jr. wrote in 1970, quote, if the nature of our electric world is that it retribalizes, then we must begin to create a new mythology and symbols to explain that world. Cyber Power stands out as an ambitious endeavor to confront this meaningful effort in new media. Scawinati and her many collaborators have done just this. Cyber Power fostered a virtual community uh, not reduced to a sense of techno primitivism and its corrupt legacy of the global village. So thank you all very much for listening. And uh, thank you again to Daniel and everyone at the uh, Fi Foundation. And if we have time, I'd be happy to um, hear anyone else's ideas or answer any questions. <laughs> we certainly have time, Mikael, but I want to uh, say just on behalf of everyone at the foundation, uh, thank you for uh, such an amazing presentation. I feel like I could listen to you talk about all of this for a long, long time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I invite everyone who's uh, here with us online to send questions our way through the Q&A if they'd like, and we can take a couple of minutes to, to answer them or share more thoughts. I know I'm kind of chomping at the bit to ask questions, so I'll, I'll leave it open, but I can start us off maybe with something. Um, you mentioned in, in the talk this, this notion of wanting to cross the history of cyber power with kind of Canadian institutional politics. Uh, I think you do a, an amazing job of sort of presenting where, like how it in, inscribes itself in the context of the Oka crisis and kind of what is what had been happening in a decade or so prior. Uh, I when I thought about Canadian institutional politics, I was also thinking about uh, artistic institutions, <laughs> and I know Cyber Powell sort of emerges at a, a very crucial moment for artist-run centers and and various networks of of uh, galleries within Canada. So I wonder if in your research you were interested in sort of identifying how Cyber Powell uh, appears or or addresses or 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 is involved with this growing network. Yeah, yeah, directly. Um, I, I mean, on the one hand, there's there's a, there's an earlier wave of kind of indigenous um, cultural organizing that happens in in the 1980s, um, and and I think of the kind of you know these 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 parallel forces. There's this anti-racist gr grassroots grounds up organization happening at the same time as this top-down thing happening. There's federal task forces. 1992 sees the federal task force on museums and first peoples. Um, it, it kind of large funding opens up at the Canada Council and Banff Center and kind of top-down things. Um, but then it's in um, in the early 1990s that we see this movement with an artist run culture. So famously Minkon Panchaya, this anti-racist artist collective uh, organizes in 1994, I think. Um, and um, other organizations, one in Vancouver uh, did a conference, Invisible Colors. Um, and so it's on the heels of this activity that, you know, a young Skawinati as part of Nation to Nation, you know, enters, um, you know, the beginnings of her art practice. In fact, it was um, because of Minkon Panchaya that the ANPAC, the, the um, um, artist-run organization, uh, national organization, was, was um, uh, uh, kind of disbanded. And then they brought on a series of initiatives, including Indigenous internships. And Scawinati did an internship um, at Obro because of this, and that's part of where she, where um, she she learned about the palace and and kind of the origins of Cyber Powell come directly from that. Yeah. 
it's this really exciting moment when, I mean, all of these, you know, here I, here I talk about Laurie Blondeau as she was like a young artist, a lot of kind of our most celebrated contemporary Indigenous artists in Canada um, were able to make a name for themselves as, as quite when they were quite young because of this uh, artist-run movement. And uh, I guess in relationship to that, what I find interesting is uh, this idea of a gathering as an important and essential, or crucial, I would say, aspect of the Cyber Powell project that this uh, tendency we have to imagine social media as something that it happens kind of connected in a connected way, but also remotely or separated from one another. Finds a different meaning in the fact that uh, people are invited to regroup and share physical space, food and drink. That's kind of uh, the, the, the the great, the great, uh, one of the great things about it too. Eh? <laughs> I still think it's remarkable. I mean, I still think it's, I mean, you know, the, the 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 field of net art history it must be said is not is you know you know there's not there's not, there's not too many books on the subject but of course none of them mention cyber powwow and and um when you look at kind of curatorial models for displaying net art um um there's very little attention to what i think was really fundamental to scavenati which was this online offline thing and uh, yeah, actually physically gathering together and making a community, like a real community that people knew each other and could continue to work together. This is, this is what uh, Scaminati was already doing with the Nation to Nation Collective. So I think it made a lot of sense for them to expand that network um, using the internet. But yeah, that still to me is just such a remarkable exhibition model today. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we've been noticing in the in the presentation of Cyber Power that we uh, are are hosting at the foundation. Uh, the newly restored version of Cyber Power has uh, doesn't have a ch uh, an interactive chat function at the moment, and so. Uh, People, if they want to communicate with one another, are sitting next to each other uh, <laughs> on computers, and they do so while they're navigating the cyber powwow space. And so it's amazing to see that mix of wanting to be integrated or, or being a part of an online or screen space, but also sharing your experience as you're walking through the different iterations of the project with the people next to you. Some of them you know, and some of them you don't. And so it becomes, again, a sort of social space to kind of address also the various ways in which we uh, interact with, I guess, technologies at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was also curious because you mentioned that specifically about the, the Laurie Blondeau piece that there's a, a performative, maybe or social aspect to it that it's the preservation of that kind of activity is is kind of a difficult thing, right, to, to do. Uh, I, I wonder if those conversations were in everyone's or these, I guess, mo aspects of the project were on everyone's mind uh, as you were sort of reflecting on the preservation of the work, like kind of how to what's the best way of preserving something that has both a kind of physical or image driven life, but also something that is social? Yeah, exactly. Good question. And it's something that's fed a lot of our thinking. I, I'll mention, you know, I wrote a chapter of my dissertation on cyber power. This is the origins of my kind of interest in it. Um, about a decade ago, I approached Scavenati and, and um, thankfully, you know, she's never thrown out anything. And so she had, you know, like Rubbermaid bins in her basement, just full of every, you know, every object, every image that was ever created, every, every invoice, every piece of communication. I know you've included some of that in your exhibition. And um, we put that together and now that's part of a, 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 in, in, an institution, an archive called the Indigenous Digital Art Archive that we created that exists at Concordia, the Jaroslavsky Institute for Studies in Canadian Art. And it was, um, yeah, kind of an interesting process for us to talk about how do you recapture um, things that were essentially social, you know, I, I mean, these, this project was something that was um, intended to be a, a kind of platform for social activity. And while it's interesting enough to go and sit through um, the actual images and sounds that, that these artists made, um, we can't actually recapture what it was like in 1997 to, to uh, engage with this material. 
Um, and so some of our strategies have involved, um, I mean, just, you know, uh, uh, curatorial models like, like uh, what, what, we've, what you've done at um, the Phi Foundation, right? Showing it on old monitors, um, um, kind of trying to allow people to get into that mindset of what it was like to engage with this graphical media in the 90s which was remarkable. I mean, that's, for those of us who are old enough to remember, it was, you know, it was incredible to see these relatively fast downloading files. These graphical spaces were um, not very common. Uh, and ultimately, um, some of that other documentation that we have can step in to show some of that social context, um, which, which has been lost, right? That we don't have uh, adequate documentation of. Yeah, it's, it, it's also incredible to see how different our gestures are as we're interfacing with these kind of structures. Uh, the, the sort of uh, the way in which the tactility of, of kind of newer, I guess, uh, technological apparatuses sort of influences the way that we interact with past versions of those. And so there's a tendency to like the drag and drop is a little different. And so I've been noticing people sort of struggling or not necessarily struggling, but having to figure out that you kind of need to engage with the icons a little differently, which is always fun. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's hard for all of us to look past mm -hmm. today's streamlined high res Photoshop surfaces of our, of our um, locked in protocols of engagement mm -hmm. that um, I mean, I think part of the benefit of showing early work like this, and I know this is something you're thinking about with your show, is, is that it allows us a view back into what the underdeveloped internet looked like, that it was mm -hmm. this space that was um, completely open for artists, especially to, to design interfaces and to script modes of interactivity um, that have all been lost since it's all, you know, these kind of black box things and, um, yeah, scripted uh, drag and drop protocols, as you say. Yep. I think it was essential for us to, to uh, for, in an exhibition that thinks about the way we use technology today to highlight not just what is happening now, but what has happened in relation to what is happening now. And sort of the reactivation is a really interesting way to describe it also, right? It's uh, something that exists, it gets reactivated. It's also, I guess, part of the, an, an, an interesting curatorial model for the project. Yeah. It's kind of imagine how it can be re-articulated through the lens of an, uh, an exhibition that's happening now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah, see there's a me, question. I just also want to really add for those who are here who are in Montreal, I mean, go look at it, right? Like, <laughs> because obviously I've just given a few images and kind of brief overview of the project, but 24 contributors, I mean, you know, rich artworks, each each of which kind of deserve attention. So if you can go spend some time with it. It's free. You can come yeah. as long as you want. You can stay for seven hours in a row if you want uh, in front of one of the monitors. I see there's a question in the Q&A uh, that I'll ask you, uh, Amika from uh, Maya. Uh, thanks so much for your talk and research, Mikael. Hearing you respond to my questions makes me think uh, you're a custodian curator in some ways. Uh, how does this term of custodian curator sit with you? Can you speak to how you are working with not only the archive, but with members and figures ongoing as galleries approach you to exhibit this work? Um, thanks, Maya. I hope you're feeling better. My friend Maya, she was sick. Um, how do I feel about the custodian curator? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I have anything profound to say about that. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm not a curator, you, you know, but I make shows sometimes. I'm, I'm a researcher, and, um, and well, <laughs> it feels really good to be able to work so closely with somebody like Scalinati. Like, um, you know, she's been so generous with me. Um, and has invited me to kind of think deeply with her about what this project was, which is which is what my interest in, but what the project means um, and kind of what that means going moving forward and the work that she and Jason Edward Lewis have done. So, I mean, they've kind of brought me into the fold 
um, to think deeply with them about ongoing Indigenous uh, vitality movement. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's some, I'm sure Maya has a more interesting angle at that, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be involved in all this stuff. You know? <laughs> And it also points out this very important dimension of the project. I think your presentation did a wonderful job at sort of uh, going back to the roots of some of the iconographies that are being used in the project and sort of identifying the roots of all of that within so-called Canadian culture. Uh, but I think you're addressing something about the future, which I know is a notion that is very important in Scalinati's work and, and her output more generally is this idea of, of kind of looking forward as well as looking backward. And so this notion of the custodian curator is also that too, right? it's, it's sort of, yeah, making sure that it it uh, stays. Yeah, well, that's interesting to me. And, and, and I guess speaks to something that I didn't um, think about when I started this research, you know, or a way, a way that kind of working with not just Scavenati, but so many of these artists um, involved in this project has informed me that I mean, yeah, that that this work is ongoing. I mean, I remember when I had um, begun this research. I, you know, you know. So I'm in my masters, and I learned about cyber powwow, and I had read, you know, all of the net art history books, and I had never heard of cyber powwow, and it was remarkable to me. Um, huge, ambitious project, right? And I remember. Um, um, the word that I was using was was um, underappreciated. I thought, oh, this project is so underappreciated. Um, and then what I what I learned quite quickly was actually it's deeply appreciated for the people who who are involved in this. This was this was monumental uh, uh, of monumental importance to so many people who um, uh, engaged with this project, and continues to be, you know, and and. Um, um, I mean, just, you know, Scalinati and Jason with their initiative for Indigenous Futures and their Indigenous Futures cluster um, have um, taken this by the horns kind of bigger than anybody else. But some of the ideas that Cyber Powwow um, put in place continue to be really um, important for a lot of artists working today. Yeah, this, this, uh, you're pointing to as, as a potential kind of uh, failure of an archive, which is this notion of uh, qualitative versus quantitative, right? Like uh, the fact that there's the, the, the appreciation uh, comes from deep engagement, not just from numbers, you know, or rep although representation and numbers are important too, but I don't know, there's something that the archive sometimes fails to note or or take account of, which is a sort of the the deep level of affect and emotion that when people engage with a work that is culturally significant. Uh, and I, I think the sort of re-articulation of the work that is it is presented makes me at least realize that even in, in an even more profound way, that it is something that gets to be reappreciated is is very thrilling. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm on the same page. And and also in terms of in terms of interactive media, I think allows us to imagine that the digital tools that we use now could have been otherwise. Yeah, this is this is um, a glimpse into this inventive early use of new media that's, I think, vital. <laughs> the proverbial uh, half-opened door. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Mikhail, I want to take a, another moment to really thank you for, for your presentation and thank ev everyone who uh, was with us uh, for sharing that, that moment with us. Um, the presentation has been recorded, as I've known, as I've noted, and so it will be made available on our website for everyone to share uh, soon. Uh, as mentioned by Mikael, the exhibition Terms of Use that presents Cyber Powwow is on at the Phi Foundation until July 9th. Uh, and so I encourage everyone who hasn't come to see the show to come and experience it, uh, experience Cyber Powwow along with uh, work from uh, close to 15 artists and collectives. Um, and um, we have a, a run of events happening very soon in, uh, in April and May, a talk with some of the artists uh, happening on April uh, 25th. It's our next event. So you're welcome to 
join us for that uh, moment. It's a series of presentations followed by a small cocktail uh, on April 25. So thank you again, Mikel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to Dahlia, who's always our resident Zoom wizard and expert and so, so appreciated. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, I, I hope to see you at the foundation uh, for the run of Terms of Use. Good night, everyone. <laughs>